Hello, we're going to try this again. I'm doing the video this time on the verse Hebrews 13, 8, which says, Jesus, the anointed one, is always the same, yesterday, today, and forever. Kind of made me wonder what else the Bible has to say about those three time periods. So we're going to start with yesterday, or the past. Thought about getting stuck in our negative past. There's a multitude of people who feel as if they can't escape, and my mom was one example. Her dad died when she was five years old. He was a traveling preacher, and he said goodbye one day and uh, left and got hit by a car and never came home. In her whole life, she had trouble trusting men after that. She was in therapy, and her psychiatrist told her it was because her dad broke her promise about not coming home. I don't know if that's true. I'm not sure what I believe about psychotherapy, but I do know that God could have healed her her hurt. Um, but she was amazing anyway. She became a pastor herself and blessed many people, but I think that damage stayed in her. And if she'd known this psalm, she probably prayed it. Psalm 77. As I thought of you, I moaned, God, where are you? I'm overwhelmed with despair as I wait for your help to arrive. I can't get a wink of sleep until you come and comfort me. Now I'm too burdened to even pray. My mom wandered, thinking of days gone by, the years long since past. I wonder how many of you can identify with sleepless nights, you know, rehearsing past hurts. I know that before I got married, the boyfriend I had um, hurt me pretty deeply, and um, it would torment me for weeks. And I couldn't sleep. I was so angry. And my roommate, Lorraine, if she's listening, shout out to thank you, Lorraine, suggested I write down what I was thinking, and it helped so much. I wrote pages and poured out all this yuck and nasty things I wanted to say that I wouldn't say as a Christian, but I got it out of my system um, safely, and the poison left, and I was able to go to sleep. It was great advice. I wish I had taken Paul's advice in Philippians 3 and that my mom had followed this verse as well. I admit that I haven't yet acquired the absolute fullness that I'm pursuing, but I run with passion into his abundance so that I may reach the pur purpose that Jesus Christ has called me to fulfill and wants me to discover. I don't depend on my own strength to accomplish this. However, I do have one compelling focus. I forget all of the past as I fasten my heart to the future instead. Isn't that a great advice? And sometimes we have to admit that we've made mistakes in our past and accept God's forgiveness and move on. Ezekiel 39. So now, this is what the Sovereign Lord says. I will end the captivity of my people. I will have mercy on all of Israel, for I jealously guard my holy reputation. They will accept responsibility for their past shame and unfaithfulness after they come home to live in peace in their own land. Accept responsibility. That's a part of the way we can deal with our past. Romans 6 says, And God is pleased with you. For in the past you were servants of sin, but now your obedience is heart deep, and your life is being molded by truth through the teaching you are devoted to. And now you celebrate your freedom from your former master, sin. You've left its bondage. And now God's perfect righteousness holds power over you. Pretty nice. Sometimes we don't want to escape the past. Sometimes we feel like we want to go back. You know, Luke uh, 9 has something to say about that. Still another said to him, Lord, I want to follow you too. But first... Let me go home and say goodbye to my entire family. Jesus responded, Why do you keep looking backward to your past and having second thoughts about following me? When you turn back, you are useless to God's kingdom realm. Seems kind of harsh on the surface, but he was understanding of the man's gut issues, that he wasn't ready to give his life wholeheartedly. I know when I was a missionary in Chicago, I missed San Diego so bad it hurt. And not just the beach and the weather, but all my friends. I was so lonely. But I had to just focus on the future 
and go forward and see what God had for me. I wish then I had known Psalm 45, 10, which says, Now listen, daughter, pay attention, and forget about your past. Put behind you every attachment to the familiar, even those who were once close to you. Not that I still don't love my San Diego friends, but God had a new vision, a new purpose for me in life. God also says in Isaiah 65, Pay close attention now. I'm creating new heavens and a new earth. All the earlier troubles, chaos, and pain are things of the past to be forgotten. Look ahead with joy. Anticipate what I'm creating. I love that. Look ahead with joy. Yay! Isaiah 65 says, The failures of the past will be forgotten. They will be hidden from my eyes. Nice. And Isaiah 43 says, Stop dwelling on the past. Don't even remember those former things. I am doing something brand new, something unheard of. Even now it sprouts and grows and matures. Don't you perceive it? God wants us to just look ahead, see what he's got for us. And sometimes we can use our past. The incredible thing is that it does shape us and we're uniquely suited to minister to others because of what we went through. We just met a young mom at church who was delivered from witchcraft. Pretty incredible. And her instinct is to hide it, to bury it. She's kind of ashamed, maybe embarrassed. And we've been telling her, no, you have to proclaim it. This is your testimony. And you know, so many people in, in um, think walking into a church that, oh, on the surface, it looks like everybody's great. Everybody's got it all together, but they don't. It's like that Matthew West song that's on the radio every five minutes now. I'm fine, yeah, I'm fine, oh, I'm fine. Hey, I'm fine, but I'm not. I'm broken. <laughs> we need to let people know that we're all broken, you know? We're here by the grace of God. Isaiah 58 says, If you are generous with the hungry and start giving yourselves to the down and out, you'll be like a well-watered garden, a gurgling spring that never runs dry. You'll use the old rubble of past lives to build new, rebuild the foundations from out of your past. You'll be known as those who can fix anything, restore old ruins, rebuild and renovate. Use the rubble of your past life to rebuild. I love that um, analogy. Second Corinthians 1. What a wonderful God we have. He is the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ the source of every mercy, and the one who so wonderfully comforts and strengthens us in our hardship and trials. And why does he do this? So that when others are troubled, needing our sympathy and encouragement, we can pass on to them this same help and comfort God has given us. That's how we use our past for the good. My husband, Bob, is so great at this. He was in that horrible accident, seriously injured, and not too long after, his first wife died of leukemia, left him with three little children, he remarried after, I think, about five years. His second wife had an affair, left him, um, got a divorce. He was able to become a counselor and talk about pain, death, divorce. I mean, hardly anybody can say, oh, you don't understand. I, I've had it so much worse than you. With God's strength, he rose above all those complications, all that pain, and um, became a, sp a spokesperson about the Lord's strength. There's other reasons we should remember our past, not just to help others, but to be grateful for where God has brought you. Ephesians 2, but don't take any of this for granted. It was only yesterday that you, out you were outsiders to God's way, had no idea about any of this. You didn't know the first thing about the way God works hadn't the faintest idea of Christ. You knew nothing of that rich history of God's covenants and promises in Israel, hadn't a clue about what God was doing in the world at large. Sometimes we have to remember our pre-Christ days. You know, think back, where has Christ brought me? What would I have been without him? That's your testimony. And it may not be being safe from witchcraft. It may not sound dramatic, but think about what you would have been like, how insecure or lonely or fearful might you have been if you didn't have Jesus in your life. And don't forget what God has done. 
Psalm 78 says, they didn't really believe the promises of God. They refused to trust him and move forward in their faith. They forgot his wonderful works and the miracles of the past. Even their exodus from Egypt, the epic miracle of his might. <laughs> Don't be like them. You know, whether you journal or not, you might want to think about at least writing down prayer requests and ticking them off or putting a giant yes when God comes through. I do that and it's so fun to look back, to flip through the pages and say yes, 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 yes. You know, God answered this one. God came through. God did what we needed him to do. It's an amazing shot in the arm of encouragement to, to see what God has done. Our past has things to teach us about ourselves, about where we came from. I really like this one. Deuteronomy 32. Read up on what happened before you were born. Dig into the past. Understand your roots. Ask your parents what it was like before you were born. Ask the old ones. They'll tell you a thing or two. Back to my mom and her story. Um, because of her dad's death, her mom had to raise four kids on welfare. They were right in the middle of a, the capital of um, Missouri. So not like poor farm kids. But she still had an outhouse. She thought my dad was a hero when he bought her a, um, her first hairbrush. This is when she was a teenager. But despite her impoverished background, she uh, managed to um, go to college. And well, she dropped out of college to get married and have a baby. But 20 years later, she dropped out of, uh, or went back to college after the divorce, went to seminary, became a pastor, and impacted hundreds of lives. Um, she was about 40, and I ended up going to seminary when I was about 40. Interesting family dynamic there. Another 40-year-old reminds us that sometimes we can get blamed for our past, which is not fun. When Moses turned 40, his heart was stirred for his people. One day he saw one of our people being violently mistreated, so he came to his rescue, and with his own hands, Moses murdered the abusive Egyptian. Moses hoped that the people realized how he had rescued one of their own, and they would recognize him as the deliverer. But how wrong he was. The next day, he came upon two of our people engaged in a fistfight, and he tried to break it up by saying, Men, you're brothers. Why would you want to hurt each other? But, but the perpetrator pushed Moses aside and said, Who do you think you are? Are you going to kill us too, like you did the Egyptian yesterday? Shaken by this, Moses fled Egypt and lived as an exile. We don't have any control over how others will treat us, but we can rest assured that God forgives. And despite the weird circumstances, God had a mind-blowing plan for Moses after he ran away to the desert. And he's got a pretty incredible plan for your life too, believe me. So what does God know about our past? Isaiah 25, O Lord, I will honor and praise your name, for you are my God. You do such wonderful things. You planned them long ago, and now you've accomplished them, just as you said. God is planning things for you. Psalm 90, a thousand years are but as yesterday to you. They're like a single hour. You know, time is kind of irrelevant to him. God is in our past because he's everywhere. Like I said, that, that it's hard to comprehend, but God is outside of time. And I love this story, John 4. Jesus entered the village of Cana of Galilee, where he had transformed water into wine. And there was a government official in Capernaum who had a son who was very sick and dying. When he heard Jesus had left Judea and was staying in Cana, he decided to make the journey to Cana. That's about 20 miles, so at least a day's walk. When he found Jesus, he begged him, You must come with me to Capernaum and heal my son. And Jesus said, You never believe unless you see signs and wonders. But the man continued to plead, You have to come with me to Capernaum before my little boy dies. And Jesus looked him in the eyes and said, Go back home now. I promise you, your son will live and not die. The man believed in his heart the words Jesus said and set off for home. When he was still a distance from Capernaum, his servants met him on the road and told him the good news. Your son is healed. He's alive. Oh, with joy, the father asked his servants, when did my son begin to recover? Yesterday, they said, about one in the afternoon. And 
All at once his fever broke and now he's well. And the father realized that it was at that very same hour that Jesus spoke the words to him, your son will live and not die. Jesus went backwards and passed and healed his son, sort of. So it's amazing. He is in your past. And he's in our tomorrow. First thing I want to say about tomorrow or our future is that we can't count on the world for our security. Tomorrow may look scary, but the world is not going to help us. Proverbs 23. Don't compare yourself to the rich. Surrender your selfish ambition and evaluate them properly. For no sooner do you start counting your wealth than it sprouts wings and flies away like an eagle in the sky. Here today, gone tomorrow. <laughs> the Bible is very explicit about trusting your wealth in the future. 1 Timothy 6. Tell those rich in this world's wealth to quit being so full of themselves and so obsessed with money, which is here today and gone tomorrow. Tell them to go after God, who piles on all the riches we could ever imagine. manage. To do good, to be rich in helping others, to be extravagantly generous. In Isaiah 47, this is the message version, and it's a little funky, but it's fun. And uh, the verse is talking about Babylon who is sort of like um, the previous Las Vegas. Our Redeemer speaks, named God of the angel armies, the Holy Israel. You said, talking to Babylon, I'm the first lady. I'll always be the pampered darling. You took nothing seriously, took nothing to heart, never gave tomorrow a thought. Well, start thinking, party girl. You're acting like the center of the universe, smugly saying to yourself, I'm number one. Isn't that fun? Second Peter 3. Since everything here today might well be gone tomorrow, do you see how essential it is to live a holy life? Daily expect the day of God, eager for its arrival. I love that. Especially as so many signs right now seem to be pointing to the end times. And I know, you know, countless generations have thought that. And maybe we're not it, but there sure is a lot happening right now. So, I'm writing this um, from South Texas, and uh, things are a little better as I'm speaking it, but when I wrote it, hundreds of thousands in um, northern Texas were out of uh, power or water, or heat. It was below zero in many parts of uh, the Midwest, which, um, sorry, it was, it was like minus 24, I think, at home. It, but it was below zero in Texas, which may not seem cold to you um, if you live in the north, but to Texas it was mind-blowing because they don't have the resources to deal with that kind of thing. They don't have um, chains and um, antifreeze and you know, good insulation and all that. A lot of the mom, mamas don't even have coats for their children. So um, when I read that verse, everything here today might well be gone tomorrow. You know, that could happen. We woke up warm and dry and fed and power and heat and water, but we were very lucky. So many in our area, and especially just to the north of us, that all changed in an instant. God is our only certainty. On the other hand, tomorrow may bring opportunity. Acts 25 says, Several days later, King Agrippa and Bernice arrived at Caesarea for a visit with Festus. During this day and many days, Festus explained Paul's situation to the king to get his opinion on the matter. And King Agrippa said to Festus, I would like to listen to this man myself. Tomorrow, he replied, you will have that opportunity. You never know what tomorrow will bring. Joshua 3, 5. Joshua said, sanctify yourselves. Tomorrow, God will make miracle wonders among you. Isn't that fun to think? Tomorrow... God may do a miracle wonder in your household. You don't know. Judges 20. All the people of Israel, the whole army, were back at Bethel weeping, sitting there in the presence of God. That day they fasted until evening. They sacrificed whole burnt offerings of peace offerings before God. And they again inquired of God. They asked, shall we again march into battle or should we call it quits? And God said, attack tomorrow. I'll give you victory. You know, I, I bet there's a lot of things that you need victory over. 
so many situations with health and relationships and jobs that we probably need victory over. Don't give up. God may be saying, attack, keep the fight going because tomorrow I will give you victory. Second Kings 7, Elisha said, listen, God's word, the famine is over. This time tomorrow, food will be plentiful. A handful of meal for a shekel, two handfuls of grain for a shekel. The market at the city gate will be buzzing. Tomorrow, it could all be better. Second Chronicles 20. This is God's war, not yours. Tomorrow, you'll go after them. You won't have to lift a hand in this battle. Just stand firm and watch God's saving work for you to take shape. Don't be afraid. Don't waver. March out boldly tomorrow. God is with you. I hope that brings someone encouragement. I never know who's listening, but I pray one of these verses, even just one, will hit each person. You know, kind of that Rama word in your heart will zing and, and send off a little firework in your brain. First Samuel 9. The very day before, God had confided in Samuel, This time tomorrow, I'm sending a man from the land of Benjamin to meet you. You are to anoint him as prince over my people Israel. He will free my people from Philistine oppression. Yes, I know all about their hard oppression, their hard circumstances. I've heard their cries for help. That was Saul. And he was sending them a king to help them. We don't know what God is going to do tomorrow, but it's fun to live expectantly. My husband Bob is a songwriter, and he wrote another song God's been telling him, Don't Neglect Your Gift. And uh, he didn't have a chorus for it yet, and he just posted the, just the, the lyrics on Facebook. And the singer-songwriter we know in Australia, of all places, read it, got really excited about it, wrote a chorus, called Bob and said, can we co-write this? Because I love it and I'm ready to go. And Bob's like, I don't have a chorus. And he's like, I do. So, you know, we don't know what God's going to do tomorrow. And yet, we have to admit that tomorrow is uncertain. Proverbs 27, 1. Never brag about the plans you have for tomorrow, for you don't have a clue what tomorrow may bring to you. Um, Bob and I had hotel reservations for Houston and Galveston. We were going to go on a little mini vacation, and the weather just looked chilly. And I thought, you know, there's no point in going to the beach if it's going to be chilly, so we canceled. Kind of, you know, more me. I just love my beach, and I'm like, I don't want to go if I'm going to be freezing. Well, then it snowed in Galveston, and the weather was horrible, and our hotel canceled because most of their staff got the COVID virus. I mean, thank God we didn't go and get stuck and, you know, frozen and maybe couldn't even get home. A lot of the hotels are still closed um, between here and home, so it's a scary world out there. So, um, you know, of course we were um, allowed to make plans, but we have to hold them lightly because you don't know what, but God knows. He knows it all. Proverbs 16 says, within your heart, you can make plans for your future, but the Lord chooses the steps you take to get there. In James 4, similar concept. Listen, those of you who are boasting, today or tomorrow, we'll go to another city and spend some time and go into business and make heaps of profit. But you don't have a clue what tomorrow may bring. For your fleeting life is but a warm breath of air that is visible in the cold only for a moment and then vanishes. Instead, you should say, our tomorrows are in the Lord's hands. And if he is willing, we will live life to its fullest and do this or that. But here you are boasting in your ignorance for to be presumptuous about what you'll do tomorrow is evil. Whoa, that's putting it bluntly. Put it in God's hands. But we also don't want to fear tomorrow. Matthew 6 says, Give your entire attention to what God is doing right now and don't get worked up about, about what may or may not happen tomorrow. God will help you with whatever hard things come up when the time comes. It's like that old um, Corey Ten Boom story. You've probably heard this, but she's from the hiding place. She was um, famous for surviving um, the camps and uh, Hitler's Germany. And she remembers a story when she was little about being on a train ride. And she wanted um, 
to know where her ticket was, her train ticket. And her dad says, I will give it to you when the time comes. You don't need it now. And she compared that to God's grace and strength when she needed to get through um, some horrible, horrible persecution. That she couldn't imagine God's grace being that powerful because she didn't need it then. But when she did need it, God handed her the ticket, gave her the grace she needed to survive. So it is there in your tomorrow. It will be there. Acts 23 says, The commander took him by the arm and led him aside in private and asked him, What do you have to tell me? He replied, The Jews have plotted to kill Paul. Tomorrow they will ask you to bring him again to the Supreme Council under the pretense of wanting to question him further. Don't believe them because they have 40 men lying in wait to ambush Paul. These men have sworn an oath not to eat or drink until they have killed him. They're all waiting for you to agree to their request so they can carry out their plot. So tomorrow can be scary, but God worked out a way for them to figure it out. Psalm 4. Now because of you, Lord, I will lie down in peace, and sleep comes at once. For no matter what happens, I will live unafraid. That's how we should face tomorrow. Psalm 23. This is, um, you should probably have Psalm 23 memorized. This is the Passion Version. So why would I fear the future? For your goodness and love pursue me all the days of my life. Then afterward, when my life is through, I'll return to your glorious presence to be with you forever. And Revelation 21.4, another one you might have memorized, but again, the Passion Version. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and eliminate death entirely. No one will mourn or weep any longer. The pain of wounds will no longer exist, for the old order has ceased. My mom went to heaven three years ago, and I, I cling to that verse for her. We don't have to fear the future, because with God, the future is wonderful. Romans 8. Yet what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory he will reveal to us later. For all creation is waiting eagerly for that future day, when God will reveal who his children really are. There's that eagerness again. Proverbs 23, 17. Don't envy evil men, but continue to reverence the Lord at all times. For surely you have a wonderful future ahead of you. There's hope for you yet. <laughs> and Psalm 37, 37. But the good man, the blameless, the upright, the man of peace, he has a wonderful future ahead of him. For him, there is a happy ending. First Peter 1 Peter 1.4 Because Jesus was raised from the dead, we've been given a brand new life and have everything to live for, including a future in heaven. And the future starts now. God is keeping careful watch over us and the future. I like that. And of course, this is my book title, Jeremiah 29.11 For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not disaster to give you a future and a hope. First Chronicles 17. King David went in, took his place before God, and prayed, Who am I, my master God, and what is my family, that you have brought me to this place in life? But that's nothing compared to what's coming, for you've also spoken of my family far into the future, given me a glimpse in tomorrow, and looked on me, master God, as a somebody. So it's not just you. I really like that, that God has spoken of my family far into the future. He's watching your kids, your grandchildren, you know, generation upon generation. God is already in the future. Psalm 139. You are so intimately aware of me, Lord. You read my heart like an open book, and you know all the words I'm about to speak before I even start a sentence. You know every step I will take before my journey even begins. You've gone into my future to prepare the way. And in kindness, you follow behind me to spare me from the harm of my past. With your hand of love upon my life, you impart a blessing to me. This is just too wonderful, deep, and incomprehensible. Your understanding of me brings wonder and strength. You've gone into my future to prepare the way. Psalm 139. Believe it. Romans 8.38, another very famous verse. And I am convinced 
that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons. Neither our fears for today or our worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. And Psalm 125. Just as the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord's wraparound presence surrounds his people, protecting them now and forever. So all of that in mind, we can be like the Proverbs 31 wife. It says she always faces tomorrow with a smile. So we've covered yesterday and tomorrow. So what are we supposed to do with today? Well, today may bring surprises. Joshua 3, 7. The Lord told Joshua, Today I will begin to make you a great leader in the eyes of all the Israelites. They will know that I am with you, just as I was with Moses. So you maybe get called to leadership tomorrow or today. Luke 4, 20. This is Jesus. After he read this, he rolled up the scroll, handed it back to the minister, and sat down. Everyone stared at Jesus, wondering what he was about to say. Then he added, these scriptures came true today in front of you. Well, I think that was a shock to a lot of them that didn't know he was the Messiah that was expected. So today may bring a big surprise. Luke 23. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you enter your kingdom. He said, don't worry, I will. Today you will join me in paradise. That is, of course, the thief on the cross. And I doubt that he woke up that morning expecting to meet the Savior of the universe and to be in heaven before the day was out. Today could be wonderful, but could also be difficult. It may be bring problems, but we always have to be obedient and trust God. Matthew 2. After they had gone, Joseph had another dream. An angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, Get up now and flee to Egypt. Take Mary and the little one and stay there until I tell you to leave. For Herod in turn intends to search for the child to kill him. Again, probably not what Joseph was thinking. After all the amazing stuff when Jesus was born, the angels filling the skies and the shepherds running from the fields and the wise men showing up with gold and you know, he was probably in hog heaven with how wonderful God was treating them. And then he gets this message saying, flee, because somebody's out to kill all the children. But he was obedient. So that's what his day brought. Proverbs 4. Set your gaze on the path before you. With fixed purpose, look straight ahead, ignoring life's distractions. That's how we can act today. Isaiah 43. I am with you now even close to you, so never yield to fear. God is with you right now. There's no need to fear. Psalm 40, verse 2. He stooped down to lift me out of danger from the desolate pit I was in, out of the muddy mess I'd fallen into. Now he's lifted me into a firm, secure place and steadied me while I walk. Now, today, he is there ready to lift you up. Exodus 14. As Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up and saw them, Egyptians, this is the Red Sea story, coming at them. They were totally afraid. They cried out in terror to God. They told Moses, weren't the cemeteries large enough in Egypt that you had to take us out of here in the wilderness to die? What have you done to us taking us out of Egypt? Back in Egypt, didn't we tell you this would happen? Didn't we tell you, leave us alone in Egypt, we're better off slaves in Egypt than corpses in the wilderness? Moses spoke to the people, don't be afraid, stand firm and watch God do his work of salvation for you today. Take a good look at the Egyptians today, for you're never going to see them again. God will fight the battle for you. And you, you keep your mouth shut. <laughs> That's Exodus 14, uh, message version. Pretty fun. The other thing we wanted to uh, be conscious of today is not to squander it. Proverbs 24 says, professional work habits prevent poverty from becoming your permanent business partner. If you put off till tomorrow the work you could do today, tomorrow never seems to come. I'm a procrastinator, so that one hits home. Proverbs 3:28. When your friend comes to ask you for a favor, why would you say, perhaps tomorrow, when you had the money right there in your pocket, help him today? Don't put it off. 
Proverbs 6. So wake up, sleepyhead. How long will you lie there? When will you wake up and get out of bed? <laughs> Sounds like COVID, doesn't it? If you keep nodding off and thinking, I'll do it later, or say to yourself, I'll just sit back a while and rest and take it easy, just watch how the future unfolds. Deuteronomy 12. Your pattern of worship will change. Today, all of you are doing as you please. Because you have not yet arrived at the place of rest, the land your Lord God is giving you as your special possession. So, um, you know, slacking off, but it's going to change. Deuteronomy 29. Don't let your guard down. Even now, today, someone gets sidetracked from God, our God, and gets involved with the no-gods of the nations. Let some poisonous weed grow and sprout and spread among you. A person who hears the words of the covenant oath, but exempts himself, saying, I'll just live the way I please. Thank you. Don't let your guard down. Amos 6 says, Woe to you who are rushing headlong to disaster. Catastrophe is just around the corner. Woe to you those who live in luxury and expect everyone else to serve them. Woe to those who live only for today indifferent for the life or the fate of others. Woe to the playboys, the playgirls who think life is a party just for them. Woe to those who addicted to feeling good, life without pain. Those obsessed with looking good, life without wrinkles. They could not let, care less about the country going to ruin. Ouch. So we don't want to squander today. What are some things that we can do today? Now, Psalm 143, now I'm reaching out to you, thirsting for you like the dry, cracked ground thirst for rain. We can spend today reaching for God. Isaiah 1, verse 18. This is God speaking. Come now and let's deliberate over the next steps to take together. Yahweh promises you over and over, though your skins are like scarlet, I will whiten them bright like new fallen snow. Even though they are deep red like crimson, they'll mean white like wool. God is asking you today to come deliberate. Talk with him. Argue with him. Just get into a conversation. Psalm 119. I poured out my life before you, and you've always been there for me. So now I ask, teach me more of your holy decrees. Psalm 85. Now I'll listen carefully for your voice and wait to hear whatever you say all things we can be doing today now psalm 18 you set me free from captivity and now i'm standing complete ready to fight some more psalm 69 but i keep calling out to you yahweh i know you will bend down to listen to me for now is the season of favor because of your faithful love for me your answer to my prayer will be my sure salvation now is the season of favor write it down Psalm 30, how could I be silent when it's time to praise you? Now my heart sings out loud, bursting with joy, a bliss inside me that keeps singing. I can never thank you enough. Psalm 27, now teach me all about your ways and tell me what to do. Make it clear for me to understand, for I am surrounded by waiting enemies. Sometimes we feel like that, surrounded. But God is right there. Hebrews 3.13, something else to do today. You must warn each other every day while it is still today, so that none of you will be deceived by sin and hardened against God. Be a brother or sister. Deuteronomy 10. So now, Israel, what do you think God expects from you? Just this. Live in his presence in holy reverence. Follow the road he sets out for you. Love him. Serve God, your God, with everything you have in you. Obey the commandments and regulations of God I'm commanding you today. Live a good life. And I love this. Deuteronomy 30. This commandment that I'm commanding you today isn't too much for you. It's not out of your reach. It's not on a high mountain. You don't have to get mountaineers to climb the peak and bring it down to your level and explain it before you can live it. And it's not across the ocean. You don't have to send sailors out to get it, bring it back, and then explain it before you can live it. No, the word is right here and now, as near as the tongue in your mouth. 
as near as the heart in your chest. Just do it. It's Nike, right? Joshua 24, 15. If you decide that it's a bad thing to worship God, then choose a God you'd rather serve and do it today. Choose one of the gods your ancestors worshipped from the country beyond the river or one of the gods of the Amorites on whose land you're now living. As for me and my family, we'll worship God. In other words, make up your mind today who you're going to serve. Joshua 14. And here I am today, this is Caleb speaking, 85 years old. I'm as strong as I was the day Moses sent me out. I'm as strong as ever in battle. I heard a um, podcast, I can't remember her name, Australian uh, preacher, woman. I love, I can't do her accent, but she was like, here I am, Lord, I'm 85 and I'm here, and I'm here, and I'm standing, and I'm fighting, and I'm still here. I love that attitude of, here I am, you know, today, and I'm fighting, and I'm not going anywhere. Deuteronomy 11, I brought you today to the crossroad of blessing and curse. We have a choice. Psalm 95. For we are the lovers he cares for, and he is the God we worship. So drop everything else and listen to his voice. For this is what he's saying. Today, when I speak, don't even think about turning a deaf ear to me. Ah! James 4, 17. This is a challenge, too. So if you know of an opportunity to do the right thing today, yet you refrain from doing it, you're guilty of sin. Let that one sink in. So that's it. I have uh, one final verse. Psalm 41 kind of sums it all up. Everyone, praise the Lord God of Israel always and forever. For he is from eternity past and will remain for the eternity to come. That's the way it will be forever. Faithful is our king. Amen. <laughs>